sharing. We're getting everything set up here. All right, and this is night two. This is going to be the second of nine broadcasts. Looks like we've got a lot of people here, and this is pretty awesome here. Okay, so as far as, as this goes, uh, last time we covered Colonial America, the so-called periods one and two. Uh, period three, the so-called, uh, really is kind of, it's a big one, all right? So, you know, it's I'm going to do this over two nights, and on this night, I'm going to focus on the American Revolution. Thank you so much, Bree, for uh, what you see there. Now, um, as far as as far as this goes, I want to make just a quick note on period culture. Um, I think that that the numbered period culture is something that I'm not a big fan of in a push. Um, even though y'all talk about numbered periods, the exam never once mentions a numbered period. And so, some of y'all that have been going over this, you know, da 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 da, uh, y'all need to get over that, okay? Because when it comes down to it, the numbered periods are just a convenient way to, uh, you know, to know what's on the exam and stuff like that. Uh, but at the same time, you don't typically hear me refer to numbered periods because I don't think it necessarily will help you on the exam. So what we did yesterday, uh, we focused on colonial America. And today we're going to focus on the American Revolution. Yes, uh, Jason, I am an A-push teacher. Uh, where are you going with that? Uh, curious to hear that. Um, so yeah, definitely, Jason, continue that thought. All right, so what I want to do is I want to focus on some topics. Now, tomorrow I'm going to be looking Looking at the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, Jefferson versus Hamilton, um, and all of that good stuff, okay? So as far as that goes, uh, what you see from yesterday was, uh, was Colonial America, all right? And so as far as that goes, what I want to start off with in terms of the American Revolution, and most of y'all know that I've got a YouTube channel with some stuff on there, you know, I've never posted my lecture on the American Enlightenment. And so as far as this goes, I want to start off with that. Now, if y'all have some things that are specific that y'all want me to address, um, go ahead and put something in the Q&A box. Uh, Maddie is pointing to that right now, uh, because really I want to keep tonight a little bit more flexible uh, because there are so many things I was looking at these key concepts and all that so many things can do that this is an hour so whatever your priorities are let me know so first of all I'm going to go into the American Enlightenment a little bit because we're looking into something that's really influencing the American Revolution so the Enlightenment was an 18th century European intellectual movement that emphasized rational thinking now on my YouTube channel last week I posted Posted a video about the first Great Awakening. Um, what's important to note is, you know, when we look at uh, what's going on, you know, there are debates about, you know, were the founding fathers Christians? Uh, you know, is America a Christian nation and stuff like that? And a lot of times these things are not yes or no questions. Uh, on one side, we've got the first Great Awakening, uh, you know, which was a religious revival that immediately preceded the French and Indian War and the American Revolution. Revolution. But uh, then, on the other hand, you've got the Enlightenment. Now, uh, you know, you can look at that video that I posted on the First Great Awakening, and this is an emotional kind of thing. You know, Americans, uh, you know, are more into emotional religion than Europeans, by and large. But also, this European movement, the Enlightenment, comes over and is very influential in determining how Americans think. Okay, so the emphasis here is on rational thinking. Uh, uh, that emotions do not lead to the discovery of knowledge. Uh, now, remember the, uh, you know, if you've got questions, you want to put those in the Q&A there, okay? So, French and Indian War, and I'll definitely get to that. So, influencers, John Locke and Isaac Newton. Now, when we think about John Locke, his political theories were very influential. So, if we're thinking about the Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, if Thomas Jefferson had put the Declaration of Independence into turnedin.com, uh, it would have been red flagged, okay? Because Thomas Jefferson, you know, back then, I mean, it wasn't like he was acting like he made it up, but he was using Locke's ideas. And lock your rights into place. I like it. So the natural rights of life, liberty, and property. And other things that Locke was into were religious toleration, okay, which this is something when you consider this is a consequence of the American Revolution, uh, that when we look at the 13 colonies, and especially New England, we see that Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson were run out of New England because 
because they had differing religious beliefs, you know, that the Puritan idea of religious freedom was really just the freedom to practice their own religion, not the freedom for anybody to practice a religion. And that's what Roger Williams uh, believed that people should have the right to do. But Locke believed that all religions should be to tolerated and uh, that knowledge comes from experience, you know, not from necessarily uh, you know, tradition and uh, stuff like that. Um, Isaac Newton believed that the universe is governed by natural law. And so while the first great awakening, uh, you know, is, you know, going, you know, is, is reviving this religious sentiment, there are others that are thinking in terms of, you know, that, governments are rational, the universe is rational, and we need to create a government that is based on rational principles. And so when you're thinking about this, now the American Enlightenment, as far as the prime figures here, um, there are three people who are very important that you've already heard of, okay? Th this isn't obscure stuff here, okay? So anytime you're thinking about the American Enlightenment, you're thinking in terms of Thomas Jefferson, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine, all right? And so Thomas Jefferson, a politician and philosopher, of course, the author of the Declaration of Independence. Now, Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. Now, of course, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that as far as, you know, what is it that Jefferson means by that? And, and certainly, uh, you know, this has been reinterpreted over time, but what Jefferson is writing about, but John, let's, let's be a little bit more, uh, you know, complex about this because he's really, he's rejecting the notion of hereditary nobility. What the Americans are looking, or, you know, the American colonists are resenting is that the British believed that they were better than Americans, okay? They were better than the colonists. Uh, they also believe that someone with a title of nobility is better than someone who does not have a title of nobility. And so as far as that goes, uh, you know, he writes that, that he is rejecting this notion of hereditary nobility. And so then there's Benjamin Franklin. Now, Benjamin Franklin was also on the committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson was the primary author, but he was part of a committee. So Benjamin Franklin was a politician and inventor. He invented the lightning rod. It's something that protects, uh, you know, protects things to, uh, you know, protects buildings from lightning. Uh, he's one of the people credited with bifocals, uh, thinking about like, hey, you know, uh, when you get over 40, you have these lenses that uh, now you don't have to change your glasses glasses to see and to read, you've got these bifocal lenses that when you're reading something, you look through this part. So, you know, he was an inventor. Um, Thomas Paine, who was a professional revolutionary, okay? So Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine were both driven by the Enlightenment. And so as far as that, when you look at Thomas Paine's major works, it's got Enlightenment written all over it. Common sense, the rights of man, the age of reason. So when we think about how do we come to truth, we come to truth through the senses. We come to truth through reason. And that rights are sacred. Um, and so Thomas Paine, yes, the author of Common Sense. Now, um, just while we're on Paine, uh, you know, Paine wrote Common Sense. He published Common Sense in January of 1776. And the issue was that, you know, there had been fighting ever since April of 1775 with the battles of Lexington and Concord. And Thomas Paine is wondering, why is it that the Americans are, you know, not wanting to declare independence because they're fighting the British kind of, but then not really, you know, they release, you know, the olive branch petition. And there are a lot of people, especially, you know, in the middle colonies who are hesitant to embrace this revolution. So Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense. When we think about the purpose of historical documents, he wanted to persuade Americans that independence was possible and independence was desirable and this is one of those causal factors you know leading to the declaration of independence in july of 1776 and so as far as that uh, as far as that goes uh, deism all right thomas paine and thomas jefferson benjamin franklin they tended to gravitate toward uh, deism a natural religion Okay, so yes, I mean, Payne was uh, was definitely riling folks up for the revolution. 
Okay, so deism is a natural religion. Okay, now while a lot of the founding fathers and the framers of the Constitution, uh, you know, were Christians, others were deists. Now, deism rejects any kind of sacred text or anything like that and, you know, believes in the existence from, of God, but believes in the existence of God because it's rational, not necessarily because it's taught uh, in the Bible or something like that. And it rejects, uh, you know, other things like the, uh, you know, the divinity of Christ and stuff like that, that, you know, don't go in line necessarily with rationality. So deism, when you think the Latin deus, which is the word for God, it's godism. And so as far as that goes, you know, deism is, uh, you know, deism is this belief in this rational universe governed by natural law and that God is discovered through nature. I will make sure that this PowerPoint that I've shared is shared, uh, you know, with y'all through the, uh, you know, in on the page. And as far as this goes, a lot of these founding fathers were deists. But yes, I will definitely uh, put this into uh, into that. Um, you know, deist. Yeah, here's the thing that when you think about this, that, uh, you know, Christianity and especially evangelical Christianity, if we want to think about the first great awakening, um, that God is very interested in you. OK. And so, you know, he is just present, you know, especially as you get to the second great awakening as well, um, you know, and that you should have this like more personal relationship where, yeah, the deist God is, you know, is more impersonal. Now, let's be careful, though, because it doesn't mean that God doesn't care or have a plan. Uh, when you look at Thomas Jefferson's speeches and writings, um, even in the Declaration of Independence, he invokes the term divine providence, okay? Like this idea that God is behind the American Revolution. Uh, in one of Jefferson's inaugural addresses, he compares the United States to Israel. Uh, you know, so that's something that is uh, that is a factor there. All right, so let me go ahead and, uh, and pull that down, and I'm going to, uh, you know, pull up something else. I've heard the question about the French and Indian War. So we've got the Enlightenment, um, but we've also got the French and Indian War. So let me go ahead and uh, open that up, because that's kind of the anchor of this. Now, I'm going to kind of paint over this with a broad brush, uh, because I... Uh, I have a video about this on YouTube, but I think I can give you the short version here, okay? And so what I'm going to do on here is I'm going to uh, share my screen with y'all and show y'all this uh, this presentation. Now, I don't see anybody uh, necessarily uh, using the Q&A, so remember to use the Q&A. That's always a good thing there, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and let's take a look at... The French and Indian War is a turning point. Now, this is just to kind of illustrate as far as what it is that you would need to know for, uh, you know, this exam. Like when we think about what you need to know about a war, it's not necessarily the course of the war, although there's some great military history, uh, you know, but it is about knowing why the war impacts impacted things, okay? So when we think about the French and Indian War, this is really uh, this is really the anchor for the American Revolution. Now, the first thing we need to remember is that the purpose of a colony is to make a profit for the mother country, all right? If the mother country is not making a profit, then the colony is worthless. Uh, and so in the 17th century, and we started to talk about this a little bit la last night with the triangular trade, okay? This trade between Europe and Africa and the New World. And so you've got finished goods coming from Europe, slaves from Africa, and raw materials and agricultural products coming from the New World. So the Navigation Acts were passed between 1651 and 1663. And this is, this is a, a an example of mercantilism, okay? So mercantilism, this is when trade policies, they are discouraged trade with other nations, all right? So they want to make sure that British colonies are trading with British ports and that there is going to be a tax or other financial penalty for people who are 
importing, uh, people who are taking in. So if the colonies are taking in sugar from Dutch colonies or Spanish colonies, then that is no good. So the Navigation Acts associate those with mercantilism. So these governed overseas trade. Now, luckily for the colonists, these were not enforced. The Navigation Acts were not enforced by the British government, at least prior to the French and Indian War. Um, this is a policy known as salutary neglect. Now, remember that, uh, you know, typically neglect is a bad thing. But in this case, neglect is actually a good thing. It's kind of like if your parents are going to leave for the weekend and they leave a $100 bill on the counter and they tell you not to have any parties, they'll be back in a few days. You will probably have no problem with that. So why is it that the British government's going to pass these laws and then they're not going to enforce them? Well, trade was a top priority, okay? So the colonies can either make money through direct revenue or they can make the money through trade. So so the British wanted to take this in uh, via trade. And so they also had a very limited troop presence. This guy kind of looks like uh, Gru from Despicable Me. I can't get over the resemblance. Um, and so what you want to look at as well, okay, is that before the French and Indian War, the British had, uh, you know, a colonial rivalry with France. And so what France did, uh, France didn't really send as many colonists. Remember, we talked last night about how the French claimed a lot of land, but they didn't really put people on it. They're setting up forts and trading posts um, in Canada. And then, of course, they're moving into um, the modern day Midwest, specifically in the Ohio River Valley. And so before the French and Indian War, the goal of the British colonial administration was trade. The Navigation Acts were not enforced, and you've got this salutary neglect and not any kind of meaningful British troop presence. And so as far as that goes, what did the French and Indian War change? Um, it changed Britain's financial situation, and Britain came to a number of conclusions. Okay, first, they concluded that the colonists who had been left alone, they were not able to respond to the French threat on their own. So when the British defeated the French, they did it um, to a large extent through British regular forces coming in. So the British military intervention in North America was expensive, okay? And there was a great amount of debt uh, that came from that. And then they decided that British troops should be permanently stationed in North America and the colonists should pay for their upkeep. So the biggest legacy of the French and Indian War is that there is not going to be any more salutary neglect. Uh, you know, ma mama and daddy are home now, and that's over. Now, not only that, but British troops are coming in. Now, of course, the colonists resent this because there's no more French threat. And so the British troops are now here, and the colonists are trying to are having to pay for their upkeep. They're very resentful about the quartering of troops. Um, the Navigation Acts. Now they are moving to strict enforcement. Why? Because they have to raise revenue. Revenue becomes a top priority rather than trade. So after the French and Indian War, the British government is trying to raise revenue. They start to enforce the Navigation Acts. No more salutary neglect. And of course, there is the presence of British troops. Now, on the other side of this, there are no more French colonies, so there's no more French threat. The colonists should be able to move into the Ohio River Valley now, right? Wrong, okay? That's not happening uh, because the British have other plans. All right, so the immediate effect of the French and Indian War was tension between the colonists and the British government over taxation, troops, and trade restrictions. I've got three T's, actually four T's if you think about tension. How about that? Tension over taxation, troops, and trade restrictions. All right. And so then, uh, you know, why do we still need the British? You know, the colonies, they felt like they'd been getting by okay. And so there's a lot of tension between 1763 and 1776. And so the long-term consequence of the French and Indian War is the American Revolution. So that's the long-term effect. Now let me go ahead and uh, stop, uh, stop sharing for a second, and we will take a look at... Uh, the Q&A and see what's going on there. 
Um, yes. Okay. Very good. Do y'all want to go through? Uh, I'm not seeing people use the uh, the question uh, thing here. Now, as far as that goes, dramatic music, awesome. Okay. Now, uh, do y'all want to kind of go through these events leading up to the American Revolution? That would make the most sense here. It looks like y'all are ready for the proclamation of 1763 and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so let me go ahead and open up the uh, the next presentation here, um, and we'll go ahead and get into the road to the American Revolution. Okay, this is gonna this is going to be helpful to us, I think. All right, so let's go ahead. I want to give the people what they want. Um, yes, we can certainly mention Pontiac's Rebellion. Now, Pontiac's Rebellion um, is, you know, coming. Uh, well, and here's the other thing. Like, it's really kind of, uh, there's a little bit of, kind of going on at the same time. Uh, you know, the British already are aware. Let's think back to what we were talking about last night with the British and the French colonists. Now, the French were friendly to the Indians, friendly French, all right? And so the French, if we think about General Patton, lead me, follow me, or get out of the way, all right? So the French say, lead me, Indians. We want to trade furs with you, but we're going to be your friends. You have some women over there, we'd like to marry them, okay? And we're not going to send a lot of colonists. Like, the French were not disruptive to Indian lifestyles. And so then when you look at the uh, at the British, yes, uh, guest name, whatever your name is, uh, the this is one thing you want to note is the French and Indian War ended with the Treaty of Paris 1763, and the American Revolutionary War ended 20 years later with the Treaty of Paris 1783. Okay. All right. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, Pontiac's Rebellion, okay, and the Proclamation Line. The British are aware they're colonists. When we think about Patton, lead me, follow me, get out of my way, the British colonists are like, get out of my way, okay? They come in and they start all these farms and they keep coming in droves. They're moving west, okay? So the British colonists are itching to move west because the whole catalyst of the war was the British and the French fighting over who was going to claim the Ohio River Valley. And so the British cracked down, okay? The British cracked down um, on this, okay, as far as as far as that goes. Yeah, so the British want to make sure that they don't upset these Indians. Now, if you want to look at point of view, that the British colonists thought, well, now that we've defeated the French, all this land is ours. Now, the British colonial administration, they've just sent troops to fight uh, a war against France. They don't want to send more troops to fight a war against the Indians, okay? So, yes, uh, 1763 and 1783, okay, so French and Indian War, 1763, and then 1783, American Revolution, okay, so it's very easy to remember that those two are exactly 20 years apart. Okay, so let's go ahead and get on to that, but yes, the proclamation line is banning folks from moving west. All right, so we're going to go ahead and share the screen again. And I'm going to go on to this, all right? So, and then I'll probably, uh, you know, move on um, as far as that at a certain point. Okay, so the road to the American Revolution. All right, so how are we getting to the Declaration of Independence, okay? So the first thing we want to think about is the French and Indian War. And so wars cost money, the British national debt, the end of salutary neglect. Now, the first thing that the British are going to do is going to be the proclamation line of 1763, where, and remember to associate this with the Appalachian Mountains. So the colonists are not going to be able to legally cross the Appalachian Mountains. We see that there is an Indian reserve here. Um, across the Appalachian Mountains. This land will be reserved for the Indians. Now, Pontiac's Rebellion is, uh, you know, is going on around that same time, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this territory. So the British are trying to offer um, the Indians uh, a little bit of space in hopes that, you know, there will not be any fighting, that they can have trade and all of that stuff. Now, the next thing, Remember to stay hydrated, everybody. The next thing 
is the quartering of troops, okay? So the British troops arrive, and so Parliament resolved to keep troops in the colonies um, for their defense, okay? Now, the thing is, for their defense, but the colonists aren't stupid. They realize, like, what's going on here, okay? So the Parliament. Now, uh, Monet made all kinds of great uh, paint. Like, he was an Impressionist painter at the turn of the 20th century, and he basically went to London and painted the Houses of Parliament several days, uh, different days, depending on what it looked like, morning, evening, foggy day, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I picked this one because it kind of looks like Mordor, doesn't it? Anybody seen Lord of the Rings? Like Shire, Baggins, you know, that sort of thing. But anyway, the first thing we want to look at, and notice I like to present things in threes, okay? Because we remember things in threes. And we also want to think about uh, you know, the timing, okay, so this is the 1760s, all right, so in 1764, Parliament passes the Sugar Act, followed by the Stamp Act in 1765, and then the Townsend Acts in 1767. Now, what I want to bring your attention to here is if you look at this table, the Stamp Act is the one that's going to cause the biggest uproar, and that is because the Sugar Act and the Townsend Acts these are import taxes. And while people don't like to pay taxes, nobody really questioned Parliament's authority to tax imports. So, you know, you think about your parents, there are some things they may tell you to do that is, uh, you know, some things parents may tell you to do that you don't like it, but you realize, you know what, they have legitimate authority here. And then there may be something else where, you know, this is exceeding that authority. So molasses. Now, molasses was, uh, you know, now there are still, I tell you what, I, I like uh, some of that uh, molasses syrup on my biscuits and stuff like that. I come from the South. Uh, but, you know, typically you don't see this kind of sugar, but this is typically what they were, uh, you know, what they were importing. Now, so the Sugar Act, this was an import tax on foreign sugar. Um, and also another thing about, now, one thing about the Sugar Act, one thing that's interesting is they actually cut the tax, but they decided to enforce it, okay? So they cut the tax in half, but they decided to enforce it. So on paper, the Sugar Act was a tax cut, but the colonists weren't stupid. They knew what was going on. And another thing here is that the Sugar Act uh, stipulated that if you were caught smuggling sugar, then you would be tried in an admiralty court. Uh, you would not receive a jury trial. And this was a sore spot because you go back to the Magna Carta, uh, which was a foundation document uh, you know from the Middle Ages in England and the Magna Carta said that you know that that there will not be taxation without consent and that there will be trial by jury and so the Sugar Act wasn't very popular but it's not uh, it's not going to result in the same kind of uproar as the Stamp Act okay so the Stamp Act was an internal tax on legal documents which prompted a great deal of mass resistance uh, in the forms of boycotts and mob violence, okay? Now, this is where the Sons of Liberty come in, and they're tarring and feathering people. They're vandalizing property. They're intimidating British uh, tax collectors into resigning their positions. Now, the Stamp Act has, uh, you know, so much staying power here. Uh, Easy E's first album, you can see where they put the Stamp Act here. Now, this was during the 1980s, uh, where they started putting the explicit lyric stamp on uh, on albums. And so, you know, Easy e is going, uh, you know, is going back to that uh, legacy of colonial America. And he's using this. This was a protest uh, thing where they had the stamp as a skull and crossbones. And the rallying cry here is no taxation without representation. Now, y'all listen up here because this is very important. A lot of people are under the impression that colonists wanted representation in Parliament. They did not want representation in Parliament. What they wanted was for their own legislatures to tax, okay? So the taxing authority, according to the colonists, was here in their legislatures, such as the Virginia House of Burgesses, not here um, in, the, uh, in the Parliament. So essentially that the only legislative body with the authority to tax colonist was the colonial the legislature of each of those colonies the British had never forced an internal tax 
on uh, the colonists. And to be clear, you know, the Stamp Act is this tax on like legal documents and other things requiring special paper. And so it had not been ratified by the colonial legislatures. So the colonists tended to see this as illegitimate. And enter the Sons of Liberty, okay, this resistance movement for the guys uh, where you see intimidation and mass protests. Now this uh, here, I want to note that we can see here um, when we're analyzing documents, we need to think about uh, when we look at visual sources that there are, there is, uh, you know, you need to think about the point of view. So when we look here, we see that there is someone being tarred and feathered. Uh, he's being fed tea. Now remember, tea's hot. Uh, you see this uh, kind of Boston Tea Party thing going on there. And this is a liberty tree. Now this is where, uh, you know, the Sons of Liberty uh, and other patriots would meet at the liberty tree or a liberty pole. Now notice the noose here. Now one thing that I think is very important when you're looking at visual sources, and that's what I wanted to emphasize tonight, is that we pick a detail, okay? So if you're analyzing the source, always consider whose side is this source on. And we can see that the, the looks on these colonists' faces, you see this colonist with a stick, they look very evil. This man here being tarred and feathered is the victim. And remember, tar, in order to be all sticky and put on somebody, it has to be hot. Uh, this wasn't just fun and games. But when, you know, if I were, you know, writing a DBQ or if I had an, a visual source SAQ, I would mention the new here and I would note how this is a you know this is portraying the sons of liberty and other patriots as lawless and not committed to the rule of law so remember that visual sources have uh, you know they have a point of view and that point of view is in the details and so the sons of liberty are sponsoring these mass protests and intimidation of British officials now the daughters of liberty uh, what they would do is create homespun fabric in order to uh, in order to assist the boycotts okay so a lot of people today go to uh you know thrift stores like you know i live in a college town and thrift stores are you know are in you know you have this thrift store and it may not be that somebody can't afford to uh you know to buy new clothes but they like to go to the thrift store because it's trendy now this is what happens here at the time uh you know that because of the Stamp Act, it's no longer fashionable. Now, what would happen is your Washingtons and your Jeffersons, if you look at an early picture of Jefferson, uh, an early painting of Jefferson, he's got a powdered wig. Um, and, you know, so you would buy these fashionable British clothes. Now, at this time, it becomes uh, the thing to do to wear homespun fabric, to wear this wear this fabric that has been, uh, you know, that has been created um, at home. And sure, it doesn't look as you know, flashy and fashionable, but it does show that somebody is patriotic, that somebody's showing solidarity, that, you know, my respect for the cause outweighs, uh, you know, my intent, you know, my desire to look fashionable. Now, here is a resignation here. Uh, now, this is with those old uh, S's before the American Revolution that the tax collector uh, resigned. Now, that tax collector resigned, if we want to think about the context here of this document, uh, the context here is that this person has obviously been, uh, you know, intimidated by the Sons of Liberty. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that you want to be looking for if you see a document-based question on the American Revolution that you're thinking about what's going on there. So this document is not going to say that Andrew Oliver Esquire has been intimidated, but you should kind of put all of that together. And that's what it means when you're going into a document's context. Now, the Stamp Act was repealed in 1766. And we see here the burial of the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act is portrayed as a baby, and they are putting that into a coffin okay so you can see here i mean this is somebody who is uh you know sympathetic to the uh you know to the colonies and there is a dog that it looks like it's uh you know it's lifting its leg or something it's uh you know dogs often appear in these uh, sort of things here so whoever's doing this is not a big fan of the stamp act you can also see with these uh you know with these skulls here all right that everything looks uh, very sinister there on the british side 
And so then, in order to make up for that lost revenue, the Townsend Acts, uh, which is another import tax, okay? So Parliament repeals the Stamp Act to try to encourage trade. And then the Townsend Acts put, uh, put a tax on paper, paint, lead, glass, and tea. Now, do you have to know all of that stuff? You know, if you want to make a three, knowing the Stamp Act is probably enough. But if you're looking to make a five, if you're writing like an LEQ or a DBQ on the uh, you know, on the American Revolution and the lead-in. Uh, you know, it's good to know stuff like this. Paper, paint, lead, glass, tea. You know, how hard is that to remember? And so the Sons of Liberty return, and the British the British troops, because of the unrest dealing with the Townsend Acts, British troops land in Boston. And that leads us to the Boston Massacre. Now, we love being Americans. We are proud of our revolution. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, these British soldiers, when they were put on trial, they were found not guilty uh, because they were being harassed by this rowdy Boston mob, uh, you know, these dock workers and the like. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, we see here that our most prominent source material out here uh, is made by Paul Revere, uh, a Boston silversmith and a member of the Sons of Liberty. So Paul Revere created this engraving and I want to take um, a quick look at this again as a visual source and we want to remember that visual sources have POV visual sources have purpose people create art for a reason so if we look here and again we should know that the context here is that British soldiers are being uh, harassed at night um, and it was originally one or two that were standing guard and other British soldiers had to come and provide relief. Um, they were throwing snowballs, ice, sticks, uh, you know, at these soldiers and they were taunting them, trying to get them to fire. And so in the night, uh, there are only so many times that a mob has to yell at you to fire before you do it. Now, let's look, though, at how Paul Revere, with this point of view, um, of a member of the Sons of Liberty, we see that the British soldiers are portrayed as being very neatly lined up, okay? Very neatly lined up. Uh, you know, you see a little bit of uh, red there. Now, of course, could be for the firing, but, you know, that also is the color of blood. Now, if we look up here, we see right above here. Now, note the captain who has got his sword raised. It, it looks like you get this mental picture of the British just marching up there, you know, let's go kill some colonists. Um, and you see here Butcher's Hall, okay? So this, being able to identify a source like this as propaganda is, is important and to be able to point out details. Now, if we look here, here, this mob looks very helpless, uh, you know, and it looks like, you know, we've got a woman here um, portrayed in the middle. And, of course, again, a dog just kind of randomly there. Um, but the colonists, it looks like these people are distraught. They're carrying these bodies away, you know, which notice this guy picking up this body and carrying it away while these guys are firing. Uh, you know, hands up, you know, don't shoot here. You know, they're, they're so, like, passive. And they're being, you know, the whole reason it's called the Boston Massacre is because of this propaganda. And so then um, when we look here, now the other thing is it looks like it's going on in broad daylight. There's plenty of light, but then Paul Revere would tell you, well, look at that. I put a moon there. Now the thing is where Paul Revere put the moon is right here in the far corner where most people are not going to notice it. So even though the moon is technically there, let's not kid ourselves. It looks like this is happening in broad daylight. And so when we analyze a visual source, we need to think about the point of view that it's coming from, the context surrounding it. So you could, you know, in order to get that document context point or going into the historical situation, as they tend to call it now, you know, you would go into that this was not as organized as it looks, that the, and then also perhaps that the soldiers were found not guilty. And so going from there, now let's just take a quick moment to remember our dearly uh, departed friend uh, Harambe, uh, you know, who, uh, my goodness. But anyway, a not guilty verdict. And with one exception, the Townsend Acts were repealed. Paper, paint, lead, glass, and tea. The tax on tea remain because, frankly, people need their caffeine. Uh, and at the time, you know, tea was the predominant uh, caffeine source for the colonies. 
And so as far as that goes, the British, they leave the tax on T because they want to make sure that they're noting that they can tax. It's kind of like for those of you looking to make a five, you might know, you might remember the Declaratory Act, which Parliament passed after repealing the Stamp Act, saying that we do reserve the right to tax. So that takes us through that initial period leading to the American Revolution. Um, then I can get into the, uh, you know, the road to revolution there, starting with the Tea Act. But let me check the Q&A real quick and make sure that I'm not uh, that I'm not missing anything. Let's take a quick look at uh, that Q&A. All right. So, yes, I am going to share all of these PowerPoints and we'll put that stuff. Uh, we'll put that stuff on, on there. All right. Ryan, good use of red ink and all of that kind. Of, oh, y'all are so funny. I tell you, I like seeing all of these uh, all of these jokes. Remember that laughter is a good study tool, okay? So for those of you that are looking at memes and you're making jokes and stuff like that, uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I, I tell you what, um, that's, uh, oh, goodness. Um, but uh, but anyway, yeah, let's go ahead. It looks like I'm doing my job here. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, co come on now, the Harambe meme is not racist. Give me a break. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, let's go ahead and uh, share my screen again and get over there. Okay, y'all y'all be respectful of Harambe. Uh, uh, okay, Aiden, don't, don't make me kick you, buddy. Don't make me kick you. Let's be respectful of our dear friend Harambe. All right, so as far as that goes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the road to revolution. I tell you what, y'all are quite a bunch here, and it's good, it's good to have a little fun together, isn't it? All right, so the road to revolution, okay? So in 1773, you've got the Tea Act, you know, followed by the Boston Tea Party. Um, and then, let me make sure here, it looks like I need to minimize this so that y'all can see that. All right, so the Tea Act followed by the Boston Tea Party and then the Intolerable Acts and the first uh, the first Continental Congress, okay? Um, and so going with that, the Tea Act gave a monopoly to the British, um, you know, the British East India Company, all right? So Parliament grants a monopoly. They thought they were doing the colonists a favor. Uh, they thought that like, you know, because what they did is Parliament's friends and the British East India Company, they need to get rid of these sur the surplus tea. And so Parliament's like, okay, we'll give you a monopoly as long as you sell the tea for cheap. But remember that when Jefferson writes in the Declaration, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, this includes that, you know, if I want to buy expensive tea, I can buy whatever tea I want, okay? That I'm, you know, personally, I'm a big tea drinker, and I would resent somebody telling me what tea I'm going to drink, acting like they're doing me a favor, because you want to do me a favor, let me be free to drink whatever tea I want. And if I want to pay a lot of money for my tea, and even if the tea's not as good, that is my right as an American. The pursuit of happiness at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, is economic freedom. It's the freedom to purchase whatever you want. And so the Boston Tea Party in 1763, I mean 1773, now this is one thing to note, that Parliament taxing the colonies is the 1760s. A lot of times I find learning by decade to be a good thing. So 1760s, and so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, Parliament grants this monopoly, the, the Boston Tea Party. Now, the Intolerable Acts in 1774, uh, you have a state of martial law. Now, this is where we get into the differences between a three and a five, okay? So the Intolerable Acts, knowing that they, they were punishment for the Boston Tea Party, uh, you know, that's probably enough to make a three on this exam. Now, for those of you that are trying to make a five and you're studying everything, uh, now, one thing I would note is the names of these different intolerable acts are less important than what they did. So, first of all, there was the Boston Port Act, which closed the Port of Boston. Uh, the Massachusetts Government Act, which placed Massachusetts under martial law, under military rule. Now, the Quartering Act. Now, the Quartering Act was an act that was uh, that was passed. It wasn't the first Quartering Act. It's kind of like, if you think about in 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law that was passed was not the first Fugitive Slave Law ever passed. It was just stricter. And so the new Quartering Act, the old Quartering Act, had basically said that the colonies need to provide quarters. And so this Quartering Act said that the British 
authorities can designate quarters. So if they see an abandoned warehouse or something like that, they can say that we're using this, okay? We're going to use this to quarter our troops. Um, the Administration of Justice Act, which said that any British official that was accused of a crime in the colonies was going to be brought back to Britain for trial. And this was especially insulting to the colonies because the Bostonians had given a fair trial to the people who were involved in the Boston Massacre. So this was very insulting to them. Now, another insult here, notice that I've got the Quebec Act a little bit different of a color, um, is that the Quebec Act was not necessarily something for the, uh, you know, that applied to the colonies directly, but those of you who have brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes your parents may punish you by punishing you directly, but other times, you know, they'll they'll do something special for one of your siblings, okay? And they'll basically do that to kind of remind you what happens when people do what they want them to do and that sort of thing there. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that's going, let's see, um, uh, is John, is JC, uh, watching this thing? Uh, JC sent me a text. I don't know if he's watching or not, but if he is, um, hey to JC and all of my friends at Chapin High School. All right, and so as far as this goes, what we see here is mil this is a cartoon military law. We see that uh, this uh, this Indian who represents, you know, you would think, okay, who is this representing? I guess it's representing the, uh, you know, the colonies, um, you know, and you can kind of presume that from this. Now, there is, uh, you know, somebody that is, uh, you know, Lady Liberty or somebody else who can't even look at it. And so that we see the colonies are being uh, fed this tea, the Boston Port Bill. So this is an anti-intolerable uh, acts cartoon. Now, the Minuteman, okay, this is the, these are the militia forces that were typically, they were, uh, they were there, you know, first organized really out in the western uh, towns and villages um, as defense against Indian attacks and such. But these Minutemen start to drill in case that they have to fight the British. And so these Minutemen are drilling and what the British decide is you can't let uh, you can't let these people have firearms and military equipment if we're going to have martial law. Okay, that sounds a little bit too much like a free society of some sort. So we've got to go and take their military equipment. So the, Le the battles of Lexington and Concord, they were fought because the British commander ordered uh, the British to go and take the arsenal at Concord, where the colonists had a store of weapons, and to spike the cannons, to take all the ammunition and get rid of it, and uh, you know all of that. So now, what happened though is that, and it was it was possibly General Thomas Gage's wife, um, who was the uh, who was the spy, um, who alerted folks that you know Paul Revere and the other riders are getting out there, and you know alerting people that the British are coming. So it's not a surprise. Now Lexington is kind of a Thermopylae style delaying engagement. Okay, so that's why they call them the battles of Lexington and Concord. They're going on at the same time at Lexington. All they've got to do is fire a couple shots and hold off the British so that the colonists can make a stand at Concord. Of course, at Lexington, it's called the shot heard round the world. Uh, and then finally, the battle here at the Old North Bridge. Now, the British eventually turned around because they were not uh, they didn't have orders to engage the colonists. And so the British turn around and they take a great many casualties on the retreat side of it, okay? And so this is really this chain of events leading to the American Revolution. Of course, there are some other things going on, such as, uh, you know, Bunker Hill and some other things. But, uh, you know, this is really, there's this gap between, I've only got a limited amount of time uh, in these webinars, but there is a gap between April of 75 and um, July of 1776 when the Declaration of Independence is issued. And I've already mentioned how Thomas Paine is bringing about this, uh, you know, how Thomas Paine is helping to motivate uh, the colonists here. All right, so uh, I tell you what, I am a big, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of that, uh, you know, of that AMSCO. All right, so as far as uh, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, I can do a few things to kind of uh, clean up here. Let me look at the Declaration of uh, of Independence here. Okay, so let me see which one. Uh, let me make sure that I'm looking at the uh, at the right thing here. Um, 
All right. Uh, just one second. Remember, ask any questions if you've got them. And let me, sorry about this. I am, um, all right. So we already talked about Thomas Paine. Let's just now remember also that the Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, is articulating John Locke's theory of natural rights. Okay. And so as far as that, let me go, let me note a few legacies of the American Revolution. Okay. So let's see what we've got, uh, what we've got here. Um, yes, definitely. Uh, Joe's Productions. Uh, I'm a big fan of Joe's Productions. And Mr. Betts class is going to be joining me for an A push review session in Miami um, this, uh, this Sunday. Information about that's on my website. So I'm going to actually be leading a live review with Mr. Betts class. And it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Betts class and I'll be sharing the stage. Um, on uh, on Sunday in Miami. Information's available on my website. Uh, I tell you what, I'm a big fan of Hip Hughes too, and I'm going to be broadcasting with Hip Hughes um, before this is all said and done. So uh, stay tuned. Go to tomritchie.net slash APUS. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, so uh, I am back. Sorry about that. It looks like I got cut off, and let me go ahead and share my camera there. All right, so uh, we're back. Excellent, excellent. He's back. All right, so going to go ahead and share my screen with you, and let's just talk about for a bit the legacies of the American Revolution, okay? And so a few things that I want to emphasize here, all right, that uh, what difference did the American Revolution make, all right? So... Let's see here. For some reason, I'm not. All right. What difference did the American Revolution make? Lots of things here. I'm going to kind of paint over this with a broad brush and kind of uh, look over a few things here. Now, first of all, republicanism. Okay, republicanism. Now, note that small r. This is not a monarchy. And so there's not a monarchy. There's a limited government under the control of the people that focuses on individual rights, representative government, and a patriotic, virtuous, and educated citizenry. Now, egalitarianism. Now, a monarchy, uh, you know, is inherently aristocratic. Now, what we're going to see is that, uh, you know, the United States certainly maintained some, you know, some degree of aristocracy in the early republic. But at least in terms of, and this is the thing here, that even Jefferson wrote about a natural aristocracy. Jefferson didn't think that, like, everyone should have equal, you know, voting rights. He didn't necessarily have a problem with property qualifications for voting and stuff like that. But at least this idea that all men are created equal and entitled to some kind of equality under the law as part of the political community. So what we see here is that no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States and no person holding any office or profit or trust under them shall without the consent of Congress accept of any present emolument office or title of any kind whatsoever. All right, so no primogenitor or titles, okay? So the other thing with, you know, primogenitor with, you know, the firstborn receiving most of the inheritance. Now, as far as slavery, which of course is, you know, a big uh, source of controversy between the revolution and the Civil War, um, by 1800, nearly every state north of the Mason-Dixon line passed laws providing for gradual emancipation of slaves. Now, note that 
very few of these states emancipated slaves immediately. This was done very slowly. And the other thing to remember is that the slave population in any of these states never exceeded, I think maybe New York had about six or seven percent or something like that. Yeah, I've got some stuff here. Okay, so in the north, uh, you know, now another thing to note here, let me just note since I referenced this, that you know, basically, yeah, you've got New York and New Jersey, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, neither one of the, none of these states has an African-American population above 8%. Now, note here also that few northern states allowed free black residents to vote, and some even banned free black settlement uh, in, into their states. Now, meanwhile, slavery is going to become more entrenched in the South, so this is going to be a dividing point here between the North and the South. Now, religious freedom is another legacy of the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom in 1786, which disestablished the Anglican Church in Virginia, um, and said that no one shall be compelled to practice a religion. The Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom was one of three accomplishments that Jefferson wanted on his epitaph. Uh, note that his presidency is not one of them. The Declaration of Independence, the Statute for Religious Freedom, and the University of Virginia. So the things Jefferson did for freedom, not the offices that Jefferson held, okay? Not there. And so then women in the revolution, you know, you got the story of Molly Pitcher, Nancy Morgan Hart, if any of you are from Georgia, the only Georgia County name for a woman. Um, and so now also Abigail Adams was very hopeful that maybe this revolution would go a little further because, you know, women were not part of the political community. A married woman couldn't own or manage her property. Uh, there were only very limited cases where a woman could own property, it tended to be a woman who was unmarried and didn't have any male guardians. And so Abigail Adams allowed herself to be optimistic in a letter to her husband that I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. So Abigail Adams is the one who wrote, remember the ladies. Now women are not gonna vote yet. They're not gonna vote for over a century after this. Um, that that's not gonna be till the 19th Amendment passed in 1920. Now. Things do change a bit for women. Uh, you know, you see Republican motherhood. Now, not big R Republican, small R Republican. Not Sarah Palin Republican. Republican as in we are all Republicans. Okay, strong families make a strong republic. And, you know, Jefferson, who was in the books, uh, wrote that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Now, a mother was supposed to provide the primary education for her sons who would be good Republican citizens. And so if a woman's going to provide the primary education for her son, then she also needs to get educated herself. Now, agrarianism is another thing that, uh, you know, this whole idea of venerating the plow and the agrarian lifestyle. Jefferson wrote that those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. And even George Washington presented himself primarily as a farmer. He designed this epic 16-sided barn um, for threshing wheat at Mount Vernon. This is my favorite thing ever. I love this barn, okay? It's almost like I should get Toby Keith to write a song or something like that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just so much cool stuff about this barn. And Washington note that the way Washington wanted to be sculpted uh, was in a manner of Republican simplicity, okay? And so the thing is, note that on this uh, sculpture of Washington, and Maddie, I know we're running out of time, and this will be the last thing that I, that I do here, so we'll be uh, wrapping up in just a bit, that Washington is showing Republican here. He wants to be shown as an ordinary farmer. Like Washington is rich. He was, I mean, now George Washington is the second richest president of the United States. But before Donald Trump became president, George Washington was the richest man ever to occupy the presidency. But he's being shown as a simple farmer. Note that he's got, uh, he's got a belly in here okay now in the 1840s there was somebody that sculpted washington as a greek god people did not like this because it did not project simple republican agrarianism 
And so Washington doesn't want to bring attention that he's richer than you. He is serving the public, much like Cincinnatus, the old uh, Roman dictator who only served for 16 days and then surrendered the, uh, the fosses, the sign of authority. And so Washington surrendered his commission after the Revolutionary War. After two terms, he stepped down from the presidency. And so we see here also these statues. They are showing the Roman fosses, the bundle of sticks. Now Washington has 13. And notice that Washington's sculpture also has a plow. So Washington wanted to be seen as a farmer, a soldier, a legend. Okay? So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, that goes into the legacies of the American Revolution. And remember that although the American Revolution is not as radical as the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, or something like that, you know, there is a, uh, you know, there certainly, uh, you know, it, there are some changes as a result of this and largely in the way of republicanism. So as far as that goes, I hope that y'all have enjoyed our broadcast this evening. I'm glad I can help. Now remember to uh, you know check out my website, tomrichie.net slash apush. And also the Bill of Rights Institute has a lot of great uh, resources for you. And Maddie, do you want to close us out? All right. Hey, guys, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, like Tom said, you can go ahead and check out Tom's website uh, for additional resources. You can also check out the Bill of Rights Institute website, the Bill of Rights Institute YouTube page, um, which I believe I've posted that link in the Q&A box. You guys can go ahead and access that for our A Push Homework Help series. That's going to be a really great resource for you. And please make sure you check out tomorrow's webinar happening at 6.30. Uh, and we'll go ahead and we'll see you there.